So continue to let us know in the chat if you're experiencing any technical difficulties. Um, and myself or Yanti will do our best to address those. Okay, everyone can hear. So thank you so much for taking the time to join us this evening. Um, we are going to be recording this. So I'm going to do that now. Um, I'm Kelsey, I'm here with Project Look Sharp at Ithaca College um, in upstate New York and thrilled to join the Media Education Lab who I've had the privilege of working with and collaborating with for several years now. Uh, Renee Haas and Yanti Friesum are both on the call and my great co-worker Sox Sperry is going to be leading most of this. Um, and he is the one running the slideshow. So these first few, while I do a few introductions, uh, he's gonna be managing that. So Sox, if you could just go briefly to the next slide. Uh, our providers today, again, the Media Education Lab, they do amazing research, thought leadership, professional development, um, all around media education based out of Rhode Island and now Chicago. Again, we're here at Project Look Sharp, or initiative out of Ithaca College. They've been around for about 20 years, predominantly grant funded by the Park Foundation. Um, and we have a ton of free curriculum on our website, and we are also offering a lot of great professional development opportunities. And another sponsor I just have up here for fun is the Fiji Girl. <laughs> uh, so if anyone has seen the Golden Globes last night, uh, we, we wish she could sponsor us based on uh, the amount of money she's making off this new contract. But, uh, we, we aren't going to give her any more airtime, um, but we will be talking about the Golden Globes uh, later tonight. Um, so, Sox, if you want to go on to the next one. Just a little bit briefly about Sox. Um, again, I am so honored to be able to have the opportunity to work with him now full time. Um, he's been a mentor for me for several years now, and he's really began his career about 30 years back um, teaching at a school really focused on civic engagement and social emotional learning. And he's really also worked um, with convicted adolescents and adults on really addressing nonviolent communication and education. And, you know, he's really drawing on all of that experience in the curriculum work he does with us um, and in the professional development he offers. Uh, Sox, if you want to go next for a minute, please. And this webinar, we're really going to be heavily drawing from the course that he started offering last year. Um, it's fully online, uh, six sessions it's every Tuesday in the evening for an hour and a half. And within that course, he really goes um, very interactive, working customized with educators on designing a plan of addressing a tough topic that you want to in your classroom um, and implementing it, reflecting on it and practicing uh, the first hour is instructional where the last half hour really does these breakout groups that we're going to do today. Um, and, you know, we can go to the website, projectbooksharp.org slash learn to learn more about that. And he's going to talk about that and how it mirrors the structure of this webinar throughout it as well. Um, but yes, it is at this time, without further ado, I will pass the baton over to Sox and go ahead and carry it away. Well, thank you so much, Kelsey. It's wonderful to be here. And I want to thank uh, Renee and Yanti and the whole team at Media Education Lab for this opportunity. Um, so appreciate working with you all now and, and long term in terms of the great work that you do. And Kelsey, thanks for that I it unmuted too. wonderful um, introduction. Uh, it's truly an honor to be working with you. And I feel like you're the bridge between Project Look Sharp and Media Education Lab. So we're going to dive right on in. Um, today, I went on this morning to Media Education Lab's website, and the quote of the day at that point was a wonderful quote from this grandparent of media literacy, Bronson Alcott, the true teacher defines his pupils against his own personal influence. And uh, this is so uh, consistent with some of the things that we'll be talking about in this course and tonight in terms of strong sense critical thinking being aware of one's own bias and bringing that forward and inviting students to do the same thing, to bring that kind of metacognition to our understanding as we uh, explore media and media constructions. It's a great quote, thank you for that. 
I'll say a little bit about the outline tonight. Uh, as Kelsey said, we're going to follow somewhat in terms of format, the same format we'll be using in the class that will start in a few weeks. I'll start with a few uh, fairly quick theoretical underpinnings for the work. We'll move and do a little bit of practice together doing constructivist media decoding. We'll then see a video of a teacher in action in the class doing some constructivist media decoding work. And we'll reflect on that pedagogy together. We'll break out into small discussion groups and talk with other educators about how to use the tools of media literacy to engage with challenging topics. And uh, we probably won't have a lot of time at the end for closing with synthesis or co-learning, but that's something that we always intend to do as well whenever we can. Uh, so without further ado, I'm gonna jump into the theory part of this. I began, as Kelsey said, the 20 years prior to my time at Project Look Sharp over the last 10 or 12 years, working in a place called the Center for Nonviolence in Fort Wayne, Indiana. He's one of the co-founders of that group, continues to go 37 years now, going strong and working with uh, predominantly adult and, and young men focused on helping people understand better uh, the relationship between belief and practice around issues of violence and nonviolence in the home. And a central principle to all our work there was do no harm. This translates into our classroom, particularly when it comes to thinking about uh, dealing with the challenging topics, to this primary principle for all of us as teachers, needing to think about how do we create safe space in our classrooms for teachers, students, everybody there. And of course, this is a part about building a safe container, um, a container that has energy for engagement in constructive dialogue so that change can occur. But unless we create safety, that's something that's really not possible. So that's a basic foundation of, of what we want to be thinking about tonight. And I would say the other paired central theme that I want to talk about is dialogue. This is one of my mentors, the work of Paolo Freire is so important to so many of us in the field of critical thinking. And I've throughout my career as an educator, I've gone back to Freire's work often. One of the things I love about Paolo is that as he talks about the centrality of dialogue in our work, he really breaks it down into the core human principles that must drive our work as teachers and educators. Um, as parents and as citizens. Trust, mutual respect, love, care, and commitment as underpinnings for our work. How do we bring those into the classroom to make this a safe container? Knowing that if we do that carefully and well, existing thoughts will change and new knowledge will be created. Um, this is from the Paolo Freire reader. And again, I I love this as just a representation of what intercommunication means between equals, a horizontal relationship that's focused on empathy, joint search for truth, that's critical, but is lodged in a matrix that's lo loving, humble, hopeful, and trusting. Um, he contrasts this with the banking system education that he sees as an A over B communicate, communicate style. So how do we work with this in the classroom itself? Well, one of the things that at Project Look Sharp we work a lot with is what we call constructivist media decoding, recognizing the constructive nature of all media messages and deconstructing those messages, but also the constructive nature of our own understanding, the metacognition behind that. What's critical as educators in the classroom, of course, is to listen to student meaning making rather than talking at students to be really listening to students, which requires an excellent capacity to ask questions and follow up questions, probing. This is partly what makes our work constructivist. One of the tools that we have in helping to create good constructivist questions that invite dialogue are these key questions for media literacy. And I believe they're available to you as a handout tonight. Uh, you can find them also on Project Look Sharp's website. Authorship, 
purpose, con content, techniques, context, economics, credibility, effects, interpretations, responses, all central questions and then the questions behind all of those that help us make deeper meaning of the media messages that we're consuming, that we're creating. And the follow-up questions are every bit as important as the initial questions. Where's your evidence for this? Why is this important? Why do I think this? And what else do I want to know? What's left out here? And how do I go about finding that out? So all of these central questions as we move forward. And so tonight, uh, to kick us off, what we'll be doing is looking at a particular theme, media constructions of race in particular, as a topic that surely can be contentious. And we're going to be using some examples uh, in this particular slide, you can see examples from three different media forms that students probably will be familiar with, uh, cartoons or comic books, uh, films, and also in this instance, the Golden Globe live televised award program. And one of the things for those of you who might have seen the Golden Globes last night, there was what's turned out to be somewhat contentious uh, joke by Andy Samberg relating to Black Panther. Didn't get strong responses from people in, in the audience that evening um, visually, but I could imagine this is something that a teacher might use the next day in a classroom to say, let's talk about his remarks about Black Panther. Uh, and what I want to suggest is that in order to be able to do that effectively, to use uh, a theme like this, a media a code like this in the classroom, one needs to think carefully about these issues of do no harm and dialogue in order to figure out how best to do this in a way that will really further the capacity to go into difficult, difficult dialogues the next day. Well, how do we do this? We begin to do this, I think, by modeling these habits of inquiry, these questions. So I want to start, as we often do with our webinars, early on with a chat. And I want to invite you just to think for a minute about these memes and other media forms relating to um, comedy, the issues of the day in this instance, and invite you just to chat in, if you would, about questions that you might ask to initiate dialogue about this meme in particular. And what I'll do is I'll just be quiet for a few minutes while we give people a chance to jump into the chat. And please don't be shy, jump on in. What are some questions you might ask? Feel free to use the key questions or just come up with some of your own. Michelle saying, how would different people interpret this message? Great question, like Kelsey says. One of the key messages and themes behind media literacy, of course, is that different people interpret messages differently. And so this is a, a really important one. Let's take a look at some others. And now they're coming in. What similarities do you see in the two characters? What visual messages are being sent by the images? Why does Disney portray the villain with darker lighting about techniques? Um, what other questions might you ask to initiate dialogue about this meme? So this is an invitation for students themselves to be asking questions. And that's part of the work of constructivist media decoding. How do the facial expressions communicate meaning? Again, about technique. And this is about intention. What's the author or creator's intent? Um, asking about ethnic voices and images who might benefit or be harmed by these messages. And then about particular aspects of this in both of these. What about the teeth? How does the meaning depend on your feeling about the two films? So this is about asking for that reflection on my own interpretation and how are my feelings, my biases, my uh, imaginings connected to that? Do we have an official Twitter hashtag for this webinar. That's an, uh, another question. Uh, Kelsey will get back to you on that. And what is the image 
uh, want to make you think or feel and why? Great questions. And we'll do the same thing now with this one. There's the uh, Twitter hashtag from Renee. Thanks, Renee. So again, what are the questions you might ask to initiate dialogue about this meme? And I'll be quiet while people dig into this one. I love that Michelle starts with just a personal reaction. This one got me in the gut. So this has taken us into that deeper material saying, hmm, there's emotional content here. And again, as we're working with these in the classroom, so important to recognize that sometimes out of the gate, just to say, how do you feel? What part of your body got pumped on this one? A shocker from Renee. What does the word co-opt mean? So that's a great question. Um, to bring onto our classroom here. What assumptions does the creator of this gra graphic apparently have? What's the message the creator wants us to get from this? That's it's about intent, treating white people as all the same. Hey, Cindy. Cindy's just coming off another webinar she had a half hour before. Welcome, that's great. So again, we're looking for questions here, not analysis so much. What bias does this meme express? So this is a question that invites us to look at bias, not just the bias I would argue of the creator, but imagining biases in the future, social biases, but also perhaps asking us about our own. And why does history get told by the winners? And how is that question reflected in this particular document? So I think the argument here is back to the first slide uh, that the film itself, Black Panther, giving rise, uh, coming out of the comic book, then gives rise to new media constructions that can help us deepen our awareness about these key issues around bias, perspective, race, construction. How should white students receive this image? Interesting question in terms of the shoulds and should students of color receive this differently and how do we define who's making that interpretation or should or should not so what i'm hoping to illustrate with these is that as i move on a particular image here's another one can help move us into dialogue in the classroom that a lecture can a carefully selected image helping us to move more deeply into that do no harm territory of dialogue. So I want to set up the next part of this where we're going to actually take a look at a teacher speaking about uh, or, or leading a classroom doing constructivist media decoding by giving a little background. This exercise will be using um, media images from National Geographic magazine. This is a lesson that was put together by uh, my brother and director of professional development and curriculum at Project Bookshop, Chris Sperry, for a kit called Seeing Africa. And it's looking at how Nas National Geographic represented Africa in its title pages on articles on Africa throughout the 1990s. So you'll see him developing um, a, a, a classroom representation, a presentation of, of these title pages. And I'm starting here with actually a quote from a much more recent issue. This is from April 2018, the kickoff to a series of issues that National Geographic did around issues of race and racial construction. And I was moved by actually by the editorial by the new editor of National Geographic. Uh, and the title of her editorial was For Decades Our Coverage Was Racist. To Rise Above Our Past, We Must Acknowledge It. And she quotes in this editorial 
uh, John Edward Mason, a professor specializing in the history of photography, who did a study of National Geographic's representation of Africa throughout history, including those 1990s images that we'll see. One of the things that Mason determined was that National Geographic did little to push its readers beyond stereotypes ingrained in white American culture. And he's talking about up to a very recent time, including the 1990s. So the lesson that I'm referring to that's available to you for free online, as Kelsey said, as all our materials are, <clears throat> is in a collection that Chris put together for the Ithaca City School District called Seeing Africa. The title of this particular activity is National Geographic's Africa. So if you put any of those in as keywords, you'd be redirected to this. You can download the PowerPoint and the teacher guide for it. And he'll be leading students through this lesson that begins with this central question. What are the messages about Africa and National Geographic's images and titles from all the articles that they uh, published about Africa in the 1990s? And this is the array that you'll see. And we are now moving into, oh, I, yes, that's right. Before I do the, the, um, the video, I, I do want to mention a bit about why I'm using this uh, as a means to move in. So in the class, we talk a good bit about what collaborative classroom culture means, how one develops a classroom that's truly collaborative. And we talk about an arc of transformation within those uh, classes that help us move from uh, beginning to intermediate into mastery as delivers of constructivist media decoding dialogue in the classroom. So in this instance, we're using this array as an example I am of a beginning process, a way to wade into the water if you've not done this before. It's a teacher-led activity, as opposed to one that students are leading or co-leading. The topical choice is um, not a hot button issue that's immediately up there right now, immigration or the wall as an example, but looking back a bit retrospectively, the 1990s, issues of stereotyping in Africa. So for many students, not all, this will be um, an issue that has less immediate topical reference. Again, depends a lot on where your classroom is, of course. And this is one where if students were providing personal opinions about this, we might at the beginning invite them to do that shared in writing personally rather than interactively in the class. So now I'm gonna show you this video um, from our uh, Project Look Sharp Media Decoding Example site. And you'll see here, if you want to take a look at this or show it to someone else, it's the last one uh, in that set, High School Social Studies, National Geographics, Africa. And the chat that I'd like you to work with as we're seeing the video, so please type in as we're doing this, um, is what did the teacher do to create safe space to explore this challenging topic? And what did you notice regarding the teaching process? <clears throat> so I'm going to jump out of this and move us into this clip. clip. And Kelsey has written in the chat box the, um, the questions that we'll be chatting about. I want you to look for the patterns of representation. What did you see in these 14 to 16 images and words about Africa? And is it starting to add up to any kind of a pattern of representation by National Geographic of Africa? I'll show each slide for just a few seconds and then I'll put one slide on that has all of the slides. And we're just going to go around and just mention, it could be one word in terms of patterns. So not a big description right now, but what do you say? We'll start with the time. 
Um, exotic. Exotic. Wildlife. Wildlife. Uh, flaws. Flaws. Desolate. Desolate. Um, poverty. Poverty. Uh, there was a lot of images of like small people and then like a large background, like wow. incredible landscapes, but really small, small people, people. Large background. Barren. Barren. Nudity. Nudity. Um, like a strange, like different. Different. Yeah. Which can expect maybe too exotic. Other key words that didn't get stated that you want to add? Anybody? Yeah. Well, when I said flaws, another one, the headline was restoration. So the fact that he needs restoration in the first place. Interesting. Anybody else? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, bright colors. Bright yeah. colors. Blues and oranges. Yeah. Say it again. Blues and oranges. Uh, and browns, I think yeah. I saw in there a lot. Anybody else? Caitlin? Uh, there was a lot of like violence and tragedy and like the titles. Violence and tragedy, particularly in the titles. Anybody want to add any others? Well, not really there's people. They're always like either hunched over or like they don't look like regular people, like, not, not that they're just like a regular people, but yeah. they look like kind of extraordinarily different. I think when you go to Africa, a lot of, or what I've heard, is that a lot of people are actually dressed in like American clothing, and this looks a lot more like cultured, but we're not really imposing anything on them, but they are. Interesting. Um, I would say that something that stuck out to me was more ancient. Like with the African marriage rituals, those are traditional. And with the kingdom of Kush, the Altai is something historic. Do you think this representation perpetuates stereotypes about Africa? Yeah. Yeah. Raise your hand if you think it does. No, are, isn't everything we saw true about Africa? Yeah. All those, those things weren't invented. So how is it that it's perpetuating series? It's only showing what we kind of want to see, because it's showing things that are meant to sell. Say more what you mean by that. I mean, it's showing things that are exoticized. It's not showing like the daily life of someone in an African city. It's showing the more exotic, interesting things that are different from our daily lives. Really? Thanks. Well, I'd say it's probably predominantly people in more Western uh, countries that buy National Geographic. Yeah. And so, um, and people, you know, we, we, to me, mean people living in Western culture, but we live in a society where people are, you know, influenced by that Western culture. And so it's normal and it's something that we're just used to. And so people, when you're buying a magazine, something like National Geographic that's supposed to be, you know, about nations that aren't yours. You want to see something different that you don't see every day. And so they're not going to emphasize the parts about Africa that are just like where you are because that's not something people are interested in looking into. They're going to show you what's exotic and special and unique to that, kind of, that continent. What ties you to that is the sense of adventure, something that you can't see here on a day-to-day -day basis, something out of the ordinary. So I think they're emphasizing those things, because like Luciano was saying, there's things that in Africa that we see here, but you don't want to see that in a magazine. You could just see it in the So, Kyra. Also, you said it leads, it leads. So Central Africa is a cycle of violence. That would so, is National Geographic intending to perpetuate stereotypes, do you think? And probably there's a lot of people involved in National Geographic that want to undermine stereotypes. Is it perpetuating stereotypes? Yeah. Based on this study, why is it perpetuating stereotypes? You kind of address that. What's the primary thing in National Geographic to make sure that it does? Sell. 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 And in order to sell, it needs to think about its target audience. and needs to address the interest of its target audience. In the process of doing that, is it making decisions and choices that perpetuate certain stereotypes about Africa? Yeah. Now, if we know that that's the case, and we recognize the kind of inherent bias thing towards exotica, towards things that are different, towards uh, a, a more unusual, uh, brighter colors, or uh, greater violence, we at least have the ability to reflect on that and recognize that what we're getting is a constructed view of Africa 
for even a very reputable and incredible magazine. Okay, um, so back to our PowerPoint. Um, so what we'd like to do at this point is to do some breakout groups and talk about what you've seen and or anything else that comes up for you um, that, that we've talked about thus far today the prompt that we're proposing for the breakout group says, what's one way you could use media learner strategies to engage learners in dialogue about a challenging topic? Feel free also to draw on what we've just seen. And Kelsey, you wanna come on for a, a minute and explain to people about the breakout groups and how that's uh, gonna happen. I'm not sure whether that's just automatic or Hello. not. Hey. Okay, so we're in the process of preparing these breakout groups right now. You're going to go into groups, as it says, of three to four and have 10 minutes to discuss just among a few of you um, so you can have a more in-depth conversation. And then you will get a notification when you have one minute left um, and you can continue to use the chat if you have questions um, along the way. But we really want to do this to encourage deeper dialogue. So now I will initiate the breakout rooms. Now open all rooms. Mm -hmm. two. Hello, Peggy. Uh, you need to unmute yourself. Hi, Andy. Hey. Now I've lost the question. <laughs> <laughs> the question is how to use media literacy practices for um, challenging or whatever the term was, um, topics. For introducing challenging topics? Yeah. Basically, Was it like that? Yeah, something like that. So it's more a chat of like how, you know, looking at what Chris was filmed in his class as a demonstration of mm -hmm. the day. And if you're doing it differently, or how do you incorporate, like, for example, and with the ad tech chat, if you're doing like on Twitter, how do, can you do that kind of thing on a Twitter chat, for example? Um, you know, that's a great thought because I find that a lot of the Twitter chats that I participate in don't have very open-ended questions. You know, they're, they're, are, they're fairly closed and they, they lo are looking for specific ideas or examples or things that people can share. How about you? Yeah, I totally. I just want to acknowledge Mary, you're with us and you unmuted yourself. Hi. Hello. Hi, Mary. Hi. So we, we took the question to uh, the Twitter sphere, trying to see how and if it's even <laughs> possible to, to have challenging topics using media literacy on a Twitter chat. So Peggy was sharing that the questions are sometimes not really open-ended and it's kind of challenging to uh, even have challenging topics. Um, Right, you have a conversation even. They're sort of uh, questions and responses. Right. Not really a dialogue, you mean? Or? Yeah. I mean, Unless I, they're really managed well. Yeah, I experience sometimes somewhat dialogue, but obviously with, I mean, now it's a little bit more characters, 280. It's not exactly, and uh, back yeah. and forth, and following the chat and following the, 
the conversation and dialogue it's clunky and kind of not intuitive so it's not it's not yeah I mean, doesn't quite flow right and as we see with the extreme example of the president that i mean twitter is more about putting your agenda out than really encouraging a dialogue mm-hmm and that's, I think that's part of the challenge that Twitter is facing now is that so everybody's yelling their agenda, but where is really the civil discussion um, between the yelling or tweeting? <laughs> <laughs> that's structurally. No, we have deep. lost a little of that, haven't we? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah, no, it's, it's definitely uh, a challenge. I, at some point, I think this year, I kind of, checked out of chats on Twitter because I just couldn't handle it anymore. It was just too much. It was a little bit yeah. <laughs> good too. Oh, make that three. <laughs> <laughs> I actually deleted my account. Oh, wow. Okay. I didn't, well, I didn't go that far. <laughs> yeah. Facebook, I did delete my account. I mean, deactivated it, but uh, Twitter, I still, that's my news feed. But um, it was my last one to delete. I, it was hard to let it go, but I decided yeah. it was not so useful. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's an interesting, I mean, there are different platform online, <laughs> like all the video annotation and dialogues. Mm -hmm. and trying in different ways to kind of encourage a dialogue but it's not I feel like with students it's not exactly it's not it it's not I haven't find my best like dialogue online dialogue tool mm -hmm. well I think a lot of it at least for me has to do with trust and you have to feel that you can trust the people that you're exchanging your ideas with, that they will use them appropriately uh, and and understand and you know consider uh, your point of view, that kind of thing. And that's hard sometimes when it's a completely new group of people every time you go into a Twitter chat, and that's different than just following someone on Twitter. Right. But I mean, even with online classes um, and the people know each other somewhat at some point of the semester, mm -hmm. it's still mm -hmm. like the discussion boards or the flip grids or I don't know what else did mm -hmm. they do. I mean, it's still not tackling the same dynamics. I mean, obviously it's not the same dynamics as on ground and face to face, but Right. It's something that would be a little bit similar. I'm still trying to figure out what is the platform to really create this kind of engagement and really deep dialogue, which is a skill, as we're saying, that is declining and needs some enhancement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so no one yeah. One of the tools that I used in educator uh, Twitter chats was participate. And I don't know if you've ever used mm -hmm. that, but it's a, it, it keeps the flow of the conversation going. So you see all the tweets in sequence and the questions are highlighted. So it's much easier to follow the conversation and then as people share resources which is one of my most valuable things from the twitter chats they automatically go into the collection so those resources are saved there for you to either go back later and look at or save or bookmark or whatever you like and that's that's a tool that i really enjoyed using for Twitter chats. Did you find that people spoke more um, more deeply in that way where they could look back yes. at the question? But I also was participating in groups where some of the, many of the people were regulars and came back every week. So it, that would help to support that too. That harkens back to what he was saying about the, uh, importance of trust in that yes, for sure 
but participate you're talking about like the the platform that yeah. is a paid platform right so it's an add in that you pay for in order to have that feature it's free the participate it's free yeah participate.com yeah. and um you can um create a group or you can join a group i thought it was okay good to know i thought it was paid okay i haven't paid anything so i don't uh, unless they've changed something recently mm -hmm. and they could have but um all of the groups i participated in they did not so it's an affinity group kind of like um maybe okay um great no that's that's good to know i'll check it out uh, to see how it works so you had your students come to participate and being part of it or it was just a, a group of educators that were having a dialogue together for me it was a group of educators because i'm retired so i don't currently have any students of my own but if i did i would use that platform for them and lots of universities have their own platforms you know for that sort of thing whether they're using blackboard or google or mm -hmm. google drive or google classroom or things like that but just having some sort of a platform for them to go to and know what to expect and how to communicate within it yeah no that's that's great we have we're using canvas which i really like it's really yeah cool. oh that's awesome how do you use it what do you mean with your students yeah yeah, yeah. so um with graduate and undergraduate students uh different like classes online classes on ground classes it just looks nice and, uh -huh. and it's really a nice platform that allows um like different variation of interaction so coming from mm -hmm. Blackboard, Moodle, and Sakai, this is like the best platform I've experienced. Not that it doesn't have issues, but, but it's, really, it's really nice and so far works great. That sounds refreshing. Sorry? Sorry, Mary. I just said my school uses Canvas too, that's all. Oh, uh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, it's been fun. I haven't had any problems with it. Great. I think it's much more flexible than, say, Blackboard, which was one of the platforms I had to use. Yeah. So we got a notification from Kelsey. So soon the breakout room will kind of dissolve. So it's going to be like immediately, suddenly we're going to okay. come back to the main chat. So just to know that the conversation might be like that suddenly. <laughs> We're going to go back and then I think Kelsey is going to mute like everybody um, just to have like a better sound. Uh, but thank you. It was okay. Great. That makes sense. Look at the, you know, the challenge thank you for, for with technology. Very good. And, and thank you for joining the, this webinar. Yes. We're happy to have you in our webinar. <laughs> Thanks for getting our conversation going. Nice to meet you both. Yes, you too. Nice to meet you. And I'll see you back in the main room. Yes. Okay. You can press on the bottom to go back to the main room if you want to. Do you see? Yeah. I haven't found it yet, but I... Yeah. Oh, yes, I see it. Okay, okay. goodbye then. I'll see you in the main room.
Okay, welcome back everybody from the chats. Wait. Oh, so people are not in yet. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I think people are back. All back. And this process that we just did for 10 minutes is actually a, a brief model of what we would do for longer in the case of the class that is really giving people an opportunity to work with this with one another um, in a more uh, a way that it's possible to have every voice heard which is really difficult when you've got a large class of 30 or a webinar with more than 30 people in it so one of the things that we'll always do then is to try to take what's been uh, talked about in the groups and bring them back to the large group. And so I'm going to invite people, to, if you're willing, to chat a little bit about maybe a particular take home, either that you said or someone else said uh, in during the time of your breakout groups or uh, prior to that when you were looking at the, the CMD uh, teacher video as well. So any thoughts you have? about how you could use media literacy strategies to engage learners in dialogue, feel free to put that in the chat. While you're doing that, I just want to uh, make note of some of the comments as I'm inviting people to summarize a little bit of, of what you talked about in the breakout groups. Some interesting responses during the time of uh, the chatting about the teaching demonstration that we just saw that I want to note for you in terms of just reflecting on the pedagogy behind introducing challenging topics into the classroom. Um, one word response, Peggy says one word responses encourage participation and tone as well, Kelsey notes. Tone is encouraging and inquisitive Positive without judgment, BH. Non judgmental responses, says Peggy. And Renee is noticing how the description gets better and more detailed as we go along. So we're really building dialogue that, that moves forward for the whole group. It's a closed question posed to the students leading or open? Really good point about thinking about leading questions or open questions. There were some of both in this teacher's presentation. Um, and is there a right answer he's looking for? Also a really important noticing. Um, learning more about the students by how they describe these images. So this is an opportunity, of course, not only to know more about the topic, but to know more about our students and to know more about one another, which is why protocols around how we treat one another in class are so very important in this. Renee's asking the closed question, do these images activate stereotypes? And she's reflecting that that's a question Chris asked. So he's moving from general questions at the outset um, and impression questions to then um, a more closed question. Uh, and uh, that's part of the purpose of the exercise, of course, is to unearth noticings in order to then get at, at central or core questions on beyond that, invite students to talk about it. Ale Alexander notes, everybody um, had a chance to share before opening up for people to add more, thus allowing more people to share their thinking rather than a couple of students dominating. Again, that's the purpose of the chats as well. Part of creating spaces for dialogues about tough topics, inviting multiple perspectives in an open way. Images shown focus um, especially on people, guides the conversation to people in their lives, not just the places. Teacher probe for evidence. Tell me where you saw that. This teacher let students lead the conversation, only interjected really to move the conversation along. As he nods, smiles, and encourages, student responses and discussion becomes contagious. The students want to participate in the meeting. That's great. Um, I like how we can see both the teacher and the students simultaneously in this video to see the interaction. And then, of course, there's also a subtext describing a bit about what the teacher's doing. And as Kelsey pointed out, there's lots of more videos that you can look at different topics and different media literacy 
uh, pedagogical perspectives that you can find on the website. It takes their input, BH says, and wraps it up in a way that acknowledges their input, but gives it focus. I love Pamela's comment here. I appreciate how welcome students were to give their opinion, reminding her of Adiche's danger of a single story TED talk that many of us know. Okay, so lots of new messages here. Kern's going to help me with this. My goodness. Okay. And I'm getting a little help from one of my supporters here. Thank you, Karin. Did Chris lead the discussion with just the images from the article or did it include the uh, context of the article? Okay, so it was just the images. What you saw on screen were the images and just the title text. So it wasn't the content of the articles themselves. Um, his demeanor, gentle, welcoming. Um, and again, there's lots and lots of material here. I, I don't really don't have time today to read through all of it. But I do want to point out that when we create structures in our classroom or in this webinar to ask good questions, the response can just take us deeper and deeper. And that's what I see you've done with one another uh, during the course of this chat. If this were part of the course, what I'd be doing is harvesting some of the awarenesses from the chat and then bringing it back to class the following week. And I'll give you an example of how we did that. Um, one of the aspects of the Challenging Topics course is we created a corral. Some people call them parking lots. We wanted to be um, a little less. Um, uh, carbon hungry, so we called it a corral. And in the corrals, students in the course, uh, our participants in the course, were invited to add their own questions to the mix that they wanted us to work with. And in our last classes, we did breakout groups with questions that had been posed by the cohort themselves. And I just wanted you to see uh, some examples of some of the kind of points, many of which have been made actually as you've chatted here. Uh, that I think give us opportunities to take this conversation even deeper. How can we successfully close a challenging lesson? How do we deal with the reality that students' unknown backstories can trigger powerful emotional memories? What are some of the pros and cons of teachers sharing personal information, both for students and for teachers themselves? Pros and cons of inviting community members to talk about challenging topics. How can we help students to distinguish between conversations that are truly unsafe and conversations that are just uncomfortable? And what are some ways to assess the comfort level of our students as we deal with challenging topics? Just some examples of questions that educators are posing with one another as we move forward in this work of talking together about how we can use the tools of media literacy to further uh, challenging topic conversation. At this point, I think I'm going to thank again everybody for their involvement, uh, Renee and Yanti, for providing our platform tonight. I want to thank Kelsey and Karen Olson Ramanujan for your help throughout the evening. It's really been great. And I'm going to pass this over to Kelsey to uh, let you know a little bit more if you do have an interest in signing up for this course. And I think registration is going to end in a couple of days. Um, she'll let you know about it. But again, many thanks to those who sponsored it, but most importantly, thanks to all of you who gave the time tonight to be here. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to working together with you in the future. So I'm signing off and letting Kelsey come on back. Okay, Socks, so don't go yet. We got I one won't. more slide after this, all right. Okay. But, <laughs> but yes, thank you so much to Socks and huge shout out to the incredible work you do. And hopefully everyone here on this webinar got just a taste of the incredible facilitation and effort that Socks puts into this. And I know one or two of you commented earlier on that, wow, this was an ambitious agenda to cover within one hour. But this is the magic of socks and really making sure to cover all of these pieces in a very uh, thoughtful, time-sensitive way, while also making sure everyone's able to 
contribute their perspectives and engage in deep conversation. Um, so again, this is what you would have an experience doing uh, for six Tuesdays in a row, and then also going and applying what you're doing in your classroom, receiving customized feedback, and really having that deep online uh, learning community. We also are leveraging a learning platform so you can communicate with educators in between um, about your experiences and sharing resources. So we're really excited about the different professional development initiatives we've been developing. We really hope you'll have um, an interest in joining the course, sharing the word, checking out our site and all the free resources that are there. Um, and Sox, if you could just go to the last slide, please. Um, and this course, I mean, you'll see, um, just feel free to reach out to me individually at kgreenforithaca.edu if you have any further questions or thoughts or wanna keep the conversation going on that more individual level. I'm happy to put you in touch with Socks too if you have content questions. And then of course on Twitter, um, you know, Renee Yanti, the Meet Education Lab is really active. Um, and then here at Project Look Sharp, our handle is Ithaca Look Sharp. Um, and uh, beyond that, we put together a really brief survey. We'd really appreciate if you'd take a moment to just complete that. Um, a lot of the questions are optional, so you can just fill in what you'd like, and it's tinyurl.com slash PLSMEL survey. Um, and beyond that, yes, we just want to take a moment again to thank Renee and Yandi for this wonderful collaboration, and we're looking forward to continuing the collaborative efforts and initiatives. And Yanti wanted me to say something also about the next media club um, is going to be the next online event that is being offered through the Media Education Lab, and you can go to their website for more information about that. Um, but again, thank you everyone for taking the time to join us tonight, and really appreciate it, and we loved everyone's contributions.